Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our continuing CLE program. Um, this, uh, this is the second evening installment, and I'm pretty sure that's the only installments we'll be having anymore because uh, people like these apparently. There will be some morning ones too, but uh, uh, we particularly like this format. Uh, more relaxed, end of the day, uh, where your minds are free and open to accept new information and new training. Um, you've picked a great program tonight. Uh, uh, this program is uh, IP Twitter style. It's going to be presented by my partner, Harrod Jacobs, and my colleague, uh, ben, uh, uh, Dan Englander. Dan comes to us from our Atlanta office. The, a juggernaut of uh, intellectual property practice, uh, and Hara is from our Philadelphia office, a juggernaut of intellectual property litigation, uh, Hara being at the forefront. Uh, their uh, resumes are in your materials. Feel free to uh, review them. Uh, I don't want to take away too much from the program. Uh, drinks will be served throughout, uh, and you will not be docked if you go outside and get another one. Uh, uh, I've checked with the CLE board. It's okay. Uh, I do want to mention our next program. I think it's uh, October 27th. Uh, it will be uh, from our family, uh, our uh, family wealth man management group. Uh, we'll be presenting uh, a seminar on Act 95, uh, dealing with new power of attorney laws. Uh, so I encourage you to come to that. I, I believe that also will be in the evening format. Uh, let's see, details. Uh, I don't have too many. I think you, the bathrooms are over there. I think you passed them on your way in. Um, food is here. Uh, drink is, we'll be back out where I'll be. Uh, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to our panel at this time. Enjoy the program again. Thanks for coming. Uh, Oh, yeah, borrow one of my kids for that. <laughs> All right, great. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, you know, a, a lot of uh, presentations, movies, other things you go to. Today, they tell you to turn off your cell phones. Uh, instead, we're going to tell you to turn yours on, uh, particularly later, um, because we're going to... Uh, have an interactive portion uh, with hypotheticals later on in the ethics portion uh, where you're going to be able to text your answers. And uh, if you did bring your phone with you, that'll be a great thing uh, to have. And uh, for people who are uh, on the uh, following us with the webinar as well. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that uh, I welcome, we welcome questions at any point in time. Uh, if you want to interrupt me or Dan at any point, just let us know, and we're happy to take questions. We think that makes for a much better interactive presentation. If people can just uh, interject, have questions, that's what we're do. We're here to be uh, helpful. All right, IP Twitter style. So I still remember being uh, in law school, and they had a there were a bunch of subjects that were, you know, in a nutshell, evidence in a nutshell. Uh, Federal Civil Procedure, in a nutshell, um, and we, we've taken that a whole, we've taken that many steps further. Uh, who needs a nutshell when you can do it in 140 characters or less? We figured if Twitter can do it, so can we. So I'm going to start out with trademarks. Um, so what's a trademark? Well, you see it, you hear it, you smell it, and you say, I know who makes that. Give some classic examples. There's the Coca-Cola script. Uh, even if you saw that script, I think in a and it didn't say Coca-Cola, but it was different lettering. It would probably remind you of Coca-Cola. There's of course the uh, now iconic Apple logo. I love the McDonald's French fries example. That's not up there for what it looks like. It's up there for smell. If if you walk onto an elevator and someone's in the elevator, you don't see them. Maybe they're kind of in the back behind a few people. If they have a bag of McDonald's French fries and they start opening it and they start eating it and you're facing forward, 
I don't think you need to see the bag with the yellow M on it. You smell that, you say, oh, someone in this elevator. Or if you're really unfortunate on your long airplane ride, maybe, this, maybe the row in front of you, the row in back of you, scarfing down the French fries, you know those are McDonald's French fries. Um, the Nike uh, Just Do It, uh, both the slogan uh, and the swoosh. Um, in terms of the sound, uh, it's one of the classic examples of a trademark sound or the, the NBC chime uh, is a terrific example. Another one uh, that I like to use is for a lot of people, if, if you heard the intro music uh, to the <laughs> HBO show The Sopranos and you just started hearing those initial beats, most people would think, I don't know if they know who the composer is uh, who put that music together, but they would probably say, ah, that's The Sopranos. And then uh, the trademark in the upper right-hand corner is there. This is just for historical trivia. Maybe we'll get on Jeopardy one day. Um, the Samson trademark in the upper right-hand corner uh, is the oldest trademark registration that's still in use. Uh, it's from 1884, uh, and it's registered for cords and line and rope. And I can't imagine that's ever going to be a Jeopardy category, but, you know, I could get lucky. Um, Let's talk a little bit about how you choose a trademark. Um, there's a whole spectrum of marks, uh, starting with, I like to start with the, the stronger types of marks on the right, which are arbitrary and fanciful, which we're going to go through. Um, those are the really good marks, the powerful marks, the ones that you can build very strong rights in, um, have a wide scope of protection. And then on the left side of the continuum are, are the weaker marks, uh, that are descriptive, uh, actually things that are generic or not even marks. Um, you can acquire rights in a, in a descriptive mark, but as I'll explain, uh, the scope of protection is, is not nearly as broad. So the strongest type of mark is, is a coined or arbitrary mark. Um, they're the strongest, and the thing that distinguishes those marks is that they don't bear any relationship to the goods or the services in connection with their use. You know, the made-up word Exxon, um, Twitter for a social media platform where people say whatever they want in 140 characters or less, um, bears no relationship. Those are the strongest marks. So next down on the continuum, and these are great marks too, or suggestive marks. Um, a suggestive mark suggests but doesn't directly describe something about the goods or services, classic examples. Um, London fog for raincoats kind of makes you think of something you might need for rainy weather. Uh, also drizzle for raincoats I think is another really good one. Um, I like the Greyhound one uh, for the bus, of course. One could also argue that perhaps that's misdescriptive because um, most people don't usually think of the Greyhound bus line as transporting you in a very Greyhound-like fashion. Let's call it an aspirational suggestive mark. The next tier of marks, um, these are descriptive marks. A descriptive mark describes a quality, a characteristic, or an ingredient of goods or services. Uh, in order to acquire rights in a descriptive mark, you have to establish secondary meaning. And what secondary meaning is, secondary meaning is that you have to demonstrate that when the public sees your mark, they know that the mark identifies the source of the product as opposed to merely describing some feature of it. And the way that you prove secondary meaning is basically to show how much love either you or your company has put into your mark, and you show the love to whether it's a court or the United States Patent and Trademark Office by showing things such as how, how many goods have goods or services have you sold under the mark? How much have you spent on advertising? What kind of advertising have you done? Have you received, for example, unsolicited uh, press attention? How long have you used those marks? How long have you used the mark? And those are all the factors that you have to show. Um, and I'll add on to that as, as I'm listing those factors, you can think of in your head, well, if I choose a descriptive mark and I have to show all that stuff, it's not going to be cheap. It's not cheap, and, and sometimes it's, it's even more than not cheap. It's a complete pain because for some private companies, you have to 
uh, disclose what might otherwise be perhaps confidential information, including sales in certain segments and how much you spend on advertising and where you do your advertising. So those are among, just for starters, the downside of using descriptive marks, despite the fact that lots of people seem to like them because they seem to be the first things that come to a lot of people's minds when choosing a new mark for goods or services. And some classic examples here, the Philadelphia Marathon is descriptive of a marathon that's held in Philadelphia that is a federally registered mark. And the Cartoon Network is, not surprisingly, totally descriptive of a television network that shows cartoons. So the last category of marks are generic marks. Uh, there actually shouldn't be called generic marks. That's, an op that's a, actually an oxymoron because if something is generic, mean, meaning it is the goods, something that's generic means it is the goods or it is the services, um, you can't acquire the exclusive right to it, and that makes sense because that would seem to be completely unfair to be able to box out your competitors from using a term that really is the goods or is the services. Classic example, um, you know, yo yo used to be a trademark, aspirin used to be a trademark, elevator used to be a trademark, escalator used to be a trademark, and the downfall that can sometimes happen if you come up with something that really is a truly a new product or a new service, you put a name on it. If you only refer to it by that name and you don't also refer to it as, say, after the trademark, put what the generic product is, uh, an aspirin analgesic, a yo-yo. What, what is that? The yo-yo return top. It's a yo-yo return top. It's a yo-yo thing that I recall as a kid once went through a window in my house. That was not good. Um, it's a yo-yo toy return top thing. Yeah. I can't imagine why return tops didn't catch on. Maybe that was part of the problem, too. Um, so you, when you have a mark, you never, ever want it to become generic. And, uh, you know, we know for clients that the process of, of choosing marks can sometimes uh, be difficult and then people pick things and they send them to legal and they have legal review them and uh, we thought that it would be good to okay this is like I, I need an Atari joystick come on I'm old uh, this is hilarious I've had nothing to drink I just I really <laughs> okay Oh, I'm totally having you do it next time. I just had to prove it to myself. Oh, you're kidding me. Okay, I give up. These people don't want to see me do this. Go ahead. You're in control. Do you have sound? Sound? This is why we have a bar. Do with the microphone being on or? 
All right. Someone want to get me a drink now. Uh, so this is a fabulous clip from an episode of 30 Rock. Um, where they're coming up for a new name of this. It's a microwave to new microwave toaster product. Just really not as funny doing it this way. Uh, and one of the characters, Kenneth, they're, 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 Alec Baldwin comes in, come up with a name, come up with a name, you know, to the TGS cast, come up with a name, and Kenneth comes up with the fun cooker, and they love it, and then all of a sudden they find out that um, Kenneth didn't really come up with the name fun cooker. Apparently he overheard the character that Tracy Morgan plays. Um, that's his phrase for his butt. Um, and not only is his phrase for his butt, uh, he proceeds to use the phrase fun cooker uh, on the television show that's depicted here in front of, you know, the huge live and televised national audience. Um, and, well, that's the end of the name fun cooker for the product once that occurs. So. There are lessons to be learned from all wonderful television programs that incorporate intellectual property into them. Um, one, you know, otherwise, I, I think Fun Cooker might, well, it's not the best mark I've ever heard for that. It wasn't bad. You want to choose, you really do want to choose a strong mark because it gives you the widest scope of protection. It's, it's certainly tempting to choose descriptive marks, but we really do encourage clients to choose stronger marks than that because um, they're much harder to acquire rights in, they're harder to protect. Uh, the don't shop at yard sales is really be creative. Uh, Kenneth uh, overhearing uh, Tracy Morgan use the word fun cooker to refer to his butt is shopping at a yard sale for a mark, and we don't recommend doing that. Um, there's also a reference in that clip to the prior uh, term that the company was going to pick for fun cooker, uh, but they then found out that it was apparently whatever the word was, was totally offensive in two different languages. Um, and so when you pick a mark, you really do have to think, glo if, if you're a global company, uh, you really do have to think globally, and, and, and that is something serious. That's something I've definitely uh, encountered in my days where someone gets really attached to a mark, and um, they, they do have more of a global business, and it's clearly not going to work uh, in, 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 let's say, a commercially significant part of their world. And the last point is uh, internet residence, which we like to mind, which we like to remind clients about. Um, you know, what's the internet about? It's it's real estate. It's location, location, location. And if you're choosing a mark um, that's important for a product or service, but you're not going to be able to uh, really have a domain name um, that corresponds to that mark, as much as you love the mark, uh, it, it may not work out at the end of the day. All right, trademark fair use. What do you need to know about that? There's two different types of fair use. Uh, the first type is what we call nominative fair use. And that is, nominative fair use is if I need to use your name to identify you, I can do that as long as I don't imply that we're pals. And here's a, here's a good example of that. Uh, some car repair shop is using BMW, um, but they're really only using so, mark, so much of the mark as reasonably necessary, which is important, which means, um, for example, let's assume it's lawful. 
for, for example, if you're going to use someone else's mark to convey that perhaps your product um, is configurable with someone else's product, uh, you don't get to take their mark and, you know, blow it up enormous with their logo and say, hey, my product works with that product, uh, because that's not using so much of the other mark as reasonably necessary. Um, that's a use that's likely from which people are likely going to conclude that you have some special connection with the other person, you have permission to do that. And um, in some ways, people will argue that the nominative fair use test is, well, a stupid test, um, because at the end of the day, what it comes down to is whatever your use is, you can't, if you're using someone else's mark to refer to their products, their services, you can't do it in a way that suggests that uh, you have a affiliation, association, or connection with them, or that you have permission to do it. There's a second type of fair use, and this is the classic or statutory fair use. And that is, if I need to use someone else's mark to describe the goods that I'm offering, it's okay because you chose a crappy mark. And this goes back to descriptive marks. This is a compelling reason to avoid descriptive marks. And let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, America Online um, had, had the mark for their mail product some years ago. For all I know, they still have it. Um, you've got mail. Uh, this telling people you've got mail when they have email is really descriptive. Uh, notwithstanding that there was a well-known movie starring both Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks, I think Nora Ephron wrote and produced, um, and I mean, that, that movie generated tons of press, and You've Got Mail was a huge part of that movie, and when you think about building rights in a descriptive mark, someone making a movie like that, throwing Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan, and a bunch of other very well-known actors and actresses in it, you would think, that's, you know, that's pretty good. It's not good enough. Uh, AT&T, when they came out with their mail product, told people, you have mail. Um, America Online sued AT&T, and the court said, yeah, you've got mail is really incredibly super descriptive, so no. Um, AT&T, you can say you have mail in America Online. You should have been more creative. Uh, similar uh, situation uh, with uh, the Apple App Store, Amazon.com has an app store. It's a store where you get apps. Uh, you're not going to be able to exclude someone else from using App Store. This is also in the section of the IP treatise called Get Real. <laughs> All right, trade dress, um, which is an area of IP that's kind of near and dear to my heart, and I've gotten to do a lot of work in this area, which I enjoy. What, what is trade dress? Well, IP Twitter style, it's a body that doesn't need a face to be recognized. So who, who do we have up here? SpongeBob SquarePants, absolutely. Um, so here are some examples of trade dress. Uh, the, the more technical definition, which is not IP Twitter style, is uh, overall look and feel of a product or its packaging. Um, have some classic and some non-classic examples here. Uh, the maker's mark, uh, shape of the overall bottle, and the melting wax uh, is trade dress. Um, the chair on the bottom left is called the Barcelona chair by a company called Knoll. Um, they have a trade dress registration on the shape of, and I just have to interject this, and maybe it's because I'm not, you know, the tallest person. I think that chair is so uncomfortable. Um, they can have their trade dress. Um, the shoes in the lower right-hand corner are, uh, those are the Skechers uh, Twinkle Toes. Um, and the trade dress is having that, having the rhinestones on the, uh, the, the tip of the shoe. Um, there's the five hour energy, which we just put up there is for the overall look and feel of the product and the packaging overall, as well as uh, the beams in the, in the upper right hand corner. And so trade dress importantly can be either the packaging for the product, or as you see there with the shoe, uh, it can be the product itself. And I'll say things like bottles or something that courts say fall somewhere in between 
um, a bottle is the packaging and at the same time can be the can be the product itself. Uh, all right, trademark infringement. What is that? Well, you see it, you hear it, and you say it, or you smell it, and you say, I know who makes that, but you're wrong. So, let's see. On the left, we have Mr. Softy, and on the right, we have Master Softy. <laughs> and on the left, Sundays is first on the back left of the truck, and then we have shakes and cones. And on the right, we have cones, Sundays, and shakes, and, you know, Master Softy has the jimmies going on the truck, um, and a slightly different shaped cone. And this is crazy willful trademark infringement. Um, apparently, Master Softy was once a Mr. Softy licensee. The license ended. So Master Softy put on Master Softy's thinking cap, <laughs> came up with something fabulously unique and ingenious, and got sued like the next day. Um, that's trademark infringement. All right. New subject. Copyright. Oh, copyright's a terrific area of law, complicated, all the rest of it. Twitter style, all the way, no problem. What's copyright? Original creative work that only the author has the right to copy, distribute, or modify for how long? Eh, a long time. Mickey. Fabulous. Uh, you know, Mickey is just never going to lose copyright. Congress will just keep changing the laws. Um, not that I have an opinion on that. What does copyright cover? Well, original works. It covers things, classic things that people think of, I think, even with copyright. It covers books. It covers music. Uh, it covers uh, the video clip, uh, which has no sound in this room. Um, it covers movies. Uh, it covers software. It covers art. Uh, it covers exam questions. It really covers a multitude uh, of different works. It can cover you know, textbooks, uh, this presentation. <clears throat> it's, it's a wide area of law. So copyright also has fair use. Um, and I will say that copyright fair use is definitely more complicated than trademark fair use. Uh, the Twitter style, well, what's fair use? Limited copying may be okay in certain circumstances. It really is a fair way to put it. And then if you want to, if you want to dig down from there, um, and I think this is best done with uh, kind of an example uh, to talk about what the factors are for copyright fair use. So on the left-hand side, um, the, 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 top, the top left is a photograph in which photographs something else that someone owns the copyright in. Someone set that up, the two people with their lovely, adorable puppies, and they look delighted. Uh, and then there's an artist, Jeff Koons, um, who saw that photograph and was so inspired by it um, he made a sculpture, uh, and the person, he made the sculpture, which is the bottom left. Um, he didn't actually get a license from the person who owned the rights to the photograph to make the sculpture, which, and he's a famous artist, and I have to suspect that if he sold that sculpture, it was not for a small amount of money. Uh, the person who owned the copyright in the photograph apparently wasn't flattered. Um, they were mad. And they sued, uh, they sued Jeff Koons, and the person who owned the photograph won, and Jeff Koons lost, because when courts look at the factors, and some of the factors that the courts look at are, the first one of the factors courts look at is, number one, the work at issue that you're, the copyrighted work. Is this an original work that you know, we give a wide scope of protection to? Is this an original creative work, this photograph? Pretty original creative. Uh, or is it just a compilation maybe of facts that's only entitled to a thin copyright? The next one, the amount taken. Well, let's take a look on the left. Uh, I'm just going to go with a lot. Uh, I don't know what Jeff Koons argued in that case, but I think he took a lot. Uh, the more you take, that's not a good factor. Uh, the next uh, factor they do look at, whether it's uh, for profit or not, uh, arguably for profit. Another factor which is very important 
is whether the work is transformative, which really means you know, have you taken what was the original copyrighted work and really made something new and different? Um, and I think the argument on the left is that turning the photograph into some type of sculpture uh, isn't that transformative. And there's also a factor is the effect of the value of the work on a whole. So take the one on the left. And then on the right, um, Jeff Koons uh, learned something from the litigation on the left. Um, because on the right, there's the magazine picture with a woman wearing sandals and uh, fabulously pedicured feet. Um, and on the bottom is a piece of work that Jeff Koons put together, um, which included, but in a, as you can see, in a very different way, the same sandaled feet. And this is a much better, this is a much better example of uh, fair use, and I would say a winning example, uh, because when you look at this, um, first, very importantly, uh, Jeff Koons' uh, work is certainly transformative. It's very different. Um, he did still take a lot of the top work, but it, it really is uh, transformative, and that, that gets him as an artist a lot of the way there. So what's copyright infringement? Well, it's copying without a defense. Uh, here we have a bootleg DVD. Um, I think if you wanted to have a good IP exam question, you could simply stick this uh, on as an image and then I guess have your students write about it for the next six years. Um, there are so many things uh, wrong with this. Uh, in this case, it's a bootleg copy of the film and that's copying. They copied the whole thing. Uh, there's, there's just no defense here. Um, in copyright infringement, particularly with uh, the advent of um, the internet and social media, uh, there is a lot of talk about secondary copyright infringement. And secondary copyright infringement is something to be very thoughtful of because secondary copyright infringement is you didn't actually do the copying. And that's what copyright law gives the right that it gives to the, to the author, to the owner of the work, the exclusive right to, to copy it, to make copies, to distribute it. Um, secondary copyright infringement is, hey, you didn't actually do the copying, but you know what? You're liable anyway. All right, this, this example will no doubt date me, but I can get over it. Napster, the absolute classic example of uh, secondary copyright infringement. Um, Napster wasn't actually copying the songs. It was a new technology that enabled other people to share songs with other people uh, and to greatly harm uh, not, not just the record companies, but actually the composers who write the songs and rely on being able to get royalties for those songs um, to feed their families and make a living, and it was definitely not good for them. Um, there are two types of secondary copyright infringement. Uh, the first is vicarious liability, and the definition of vicarious is you have the right and ability to control uh, the infringing conduct, plus you have a direct financial benefit. And one of the things that's important about vicarious copyright infringement is knowledge is not an element. If you have the right and ability to control the conduct, uh, like Napster did, and a direct financial interest like Napster did, um, you're, you're going to be liable for secondary copyright infringement. Uh, the second theory of secondary copyright infringement is contributory copyright infringement. For contributory copyright infringement, it does require knowledge. You have to have knowledge of the infringing conduct, and you have to make a material contribution to it. And a material contribution could be lots of different things, whether you're enabling, uh, for example, there's the social media websites or lots of other websites where you're really enabling um, people to, uh, to, do, uh, to either upload the infringing work or to engage in the infringing conduct. All right, so what is false advertising? It's exactly what it says. Your advertisement isn't really true. I have to say this one is a personal favorite because I used Skechers before for their twinkle toe shoes. So um, here we go, shape ups. 
and I actually can't. I re oh, I can read it on this one. Okay, good. So apparently Skechers um, doesn't make shoes. They make magic wands and miracles. Um, because this shoe improves your posture and your circulation, um, strengthens the, your back, tightens your abs, firms your butt, uh, tones, reduces knee joint stress, firms calf muscles, and of course it does all those things while you're wearing the shoes sitting on your couch eating Chex Mix. Um, not surprisingly, uh, all of those statements aren't really true. And when you make statements like that, um, not only do consumers get upset, but if you're Skechers, the FTC gets really upset. So the FTC sued them and had uh, Skechers fork over $40 million um, for their awesome, completely ridiculous ad. I don't know what else to call it. Who is the attorney that uh, I, I don't know. You know, but sometimes they just ignore the attorneys. They say, you know what? Eh, I'll roll the dice. I'll take my risk. It's okay. It'll work out. I like writing checks to the FTC. Uh, next topic, um, right of publicity. And this is becoming, you know, I, I, I will say, some years ago, right of publicity was something that I think people really only thought of maybe much more so in the corners of both uh, New York and California, uh, but particularly with the advent of social media um, and, you know, basically people being able to take pictures of celebrity, maybe celebrities at their place of business and posting them. Um, this is, and celebrity endor endorsements are even more prolific today than they ever were. Um, this really is an important area of law. So what's right of publicity? Uh, well, when you, you, you violate someone's right of publicity when you use someone else to sell your product without their permission. Uh, one very important fact about right of publicity as opposed to copyright and trademark law, right of publicity is not federal. It is on a state-by-state -state level, and the state laws differ wildly. Um, this will not be a surprise. Uh, don't mess around with right of publicity in California because the California legislature is there to protect its stars who pay taxes, big taxes, in their state. Um, so there are some incredibly harsh penalties in California for violating right of publicity, and the way that right of publicity is governed is it's governed by uh, the domicile of the person who is bringing the action. For kicks? Try it. I'm so disappointed. I know. whole deal with you selling Peterman your stories for his book and then he gave him what <laughs> I was kind of uh, <laughs> short on material and uh, I put him in the book anyway you put my life stories in his autobiography uh, Kramer listen it is such a stupid book it doesn't matter oh, well, it sure it matters <laughs> wow I've broken through huh yeah, I'm Part of popular culture now. I'd like to thank you for doing doing a book signing at Walden Books this afternoon. Walden Books? That's a major chain, huh? Hey, Jerry, I'm going to Walden Books. Oh, get out! Get out! I don't want to live like this! Hey, buddy. Remember me? You're that gangly fellow we bought the stories from. Yeah, yeah I'm just here to do my part. What's your name, Don? Who are you? Well, I'm, uh, I'm the real Peter. All right, playtime's over. Man, enough juice here to keep us all fat and giggly. Okay, let's go, Flint. That's enough. We have a right to be here. Come on. These are my fans. Hey, you're hurting my own. thing this guy's qualified to give a tour of is reality. All right, so, uh, by the way, that, that same episode of Seinfeld also has a great little sketch on trade secrets. Uh, who knew there was such great IP and all these awesome television shows? 
Um, that's a, that, that, that vignette may be more of an example of you really want to be thinking about who you do business with on any level before you actually do it, more so than even uh, right of publicity. So what does right of publicity protect? It protects someone's identity. And that's really important because in most statutes, the question is, what is an identity? Well, it means that you can't use someone's name. You can't use their likeness. You can't use their voice. There have been some famous cases involving uh, musical artists where their people have tried to do, say, a sound-alike in a commercial. Um, for some people, it could be a, a recognizable activity or a, <clears throat> or a persona. Um, that classic picture there, Buzz Aldrin, um, he's, 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 he's made a fortune off of that. That's all I have to say. Uh, he's made a fortune off of it sending cease and desist letters to people because everybody knows that even though you can't see him in the suit, that everybody knows who that is, and that's his persona. And if you use that photo to promote a product or a service in any way, I guarantee you will hear from his lawyer, who's otherwise seemingly a perfectly lovely person. Um, so identity is important. You, you can't just think, well, if I don't use their name or you know, an obvious picture of someone else, then it's not their identity, because identity can be lots of things. And what it really comes down to is, is that person going to be recognizable from whatever it is that you used? All right. The next part of right of publicity is whether the use is a commercial use. And so it goes down to commercial versus non-commercial. There's some obvious commercial uses, um, advertising, placing things on merchandise, uh, use in connection with services. Those are obvious. Uh, here's a very recent example of a case that was brought. Um, uh, I think it's Call of Duty is the video game. Uh, in their newest uh, launch, uh, put uh, a either it's Noriega or a look-alike, I don't know what their position is, um, in the video game and Noriega doesn't like it and they make a lot of money off of it, so he's suing um, for using his likeness in, for commercial use in, in the video game. <clears throat> what are some non-commercial uses? Well, news is an obvious one, um, although I'll say that news seems obvious and then I think you see a lot of these magazines where they really put pictures of famous people doing things that, or I should say celebrities, you know, for example, walking their dog, um, which isn't a, really a famous thing to be doing or notable, and yet they stick it on the cover of a magazine and sell it. And I can tell you that's not a commercial use, that's a non-commercial use. Uh, sports broadcasts, uh, matters in, of the public interest and Artistic uh, expression, um, for example, maybe making a painting or something else uh, of someone's image. Um, there's a fairly famous case involving the Three Stooges. Uh, I can tell you that if you make a thousand T-shirts of someone's image and you sell them, that's commercial. Um, if you make two, maybe it's not. Depends on which judge you draw. So we put this one in here. I don't know if uh, we don't have a polling question for this one. We only have the polling question for ethics. But um, I was interested in th so this photo is on the U.S. Open website, and that's um, that is Will Ferrell um, looking kind of cavemanish uh, in his U.S. Open uh, sweatshirt. Um, he also doesn't seem that enthralled that anyone's taking his picture at that moment. Um, and the U.S. Open, in order to promote the tennis tournament, has on a section of its website the top celebrity moments of the 2014 U.S. Open. And it very well may be that, in fact, the U.S. Open has Will, Fer Will Ferrell's permission, um, you know, because maybe they gave him free tickets and the cool sweatshirt, and, you know, we all want one of those lanyards that's hanging around his neck um, to you know, and agreed and agree to do this. I don't know whether he did or he didn't, but when we saw it, we thought it was a very, you know, kind of interesting, uh, interesting crossover there. Is this a commercial use uh, or not? And I, you know, I would say that these are the type of classic uses that um, are really going on now, especially promoting this on websites and in social media. And obviously the best practice is to make sure that if you have a deal like that, you want to, 
you want to get permission. All right, so the next <clears throat> topic, what do you need to know about trade secrets? Well, what is a trade secret? Trade secrets really aren't that complicated. It's a secret, and it's a secret that gives you a leg up on your competition. What does it mean to be a secret? Well, let's show an example. This is a classic example that was a case uh, that was here in the Eastern District. Um, the nooks and crannies in the English muffin are definitely a secret. And if you are one of the very few people who knows how they get the nooks and crannies in the English muffin, I can tell you what. When you have a non-compete, you're not going to go work for a competing uh, company who makes bread or bread products or anything like it. Um, so what, when, when you're thinking about protecting trade secrets, and again, what are they? Well, it's, it's something that you keep a secret and gives you a leg up on your competitors. What does it mean that it's a secret? Well, it's, it's a secret if you, keep re if you take reasonable measures to keep it a secret. And, and then you say, okay, well, what are reasonable measures? And the answer to that is, well, what is it that you're protecting? If it's the formula to Coke, um, it's, if it's the formula to Coca-Cola, well, then it better be in a vault uh, behind tons of security, and there better be a very limited number of people allowed to get into that vault or anywhere near that vault in a rather elaborate security process. If it's, say, your company's pricing strategy or maybe target customer list, um, you would certainly want to have uh, – security measures around that and not widely distribute it uh, and obviously mark it as being confidential and secure. At the same time, no one would expect a company to have its pricing strategy or prospective customers or future business plans kept in the type of vault where you would expect Coca-Cola um, to keep uh, the formula to Coke. So, I mean, the question really does come down to in those cases, did you take reasonable measures to keep it a secret in light of whatever it is? And it also has to be something that gives you a competitive advantage, meaning, well, you might really do your best to keep something a secret, but if there are 10 other people out there who are your competitors and they also have it and they're also using it, um, I would sue over it. That one's definitely going to be a loser. And trade secrets uh, are important because that's really a type of intellectual property when you're thinking about protecting that you really want to think about hard up front and to employ all the right measures so that if you do have a problem down the line, um, you are able to go and take legal action and not be concerned that you're going to come back and get a decision that says actually that you have nothing and that what you claim is your secret and gives you a strong competitive advantage is now basically available to the free world for people to use. So the last area I wanted to touch on before um, Dan comes up and covers ethics, and maybe I'll go back and give the 30 Rock video one last try. It is a really good one. We'll give it a shot. Um, so we still have a little bit of time. Uh, I mentioned before about false advertising and the fabulous Skechers ad, which if I put those shoes on my feet, it's going to transform my entire physical body inside of 45 seconds. Um, that that the FTC is very serious about regulating how people advertise and promote themselves in social media because one of the things about social media is that people who use social media are either having a conversation, and sometimes they know they're having a conversation with someone who owns the brand and is behind the brand, but other times they think they're having a conversation with someone who really is a customer um, and let's say who's, who appears to be a neutral party. And what that person has to say and the weight that that's given is going to be a different type of weight than if you know that someone is being paid to talk to you about a product or a service. And what, what I think is one of the most important FTC guidelines is that uh, the FTC doesn't care if whatever the newest uh, you know, social media um, platform is, whether it's Twitter and 140 characters or Snapchat or whatever it is, the FTC doesn't care how much room you have to say what you need to say, because basically the FTC's position is if you have enough space to advertise, then you have enough space to disclose, which kind of makes me think about telling one's children, well, if you had enough time to play on the computer or do anything else, and you actually did have enough time to clean your room. Uh, it's not all that different than that. So 
the FTC is very, is very serious on that point. It's also very serious on the point about what these disclosures need to be. They need to be clear. They need to be uh, conspicuous. And if you are being paid to hawk a product in social media, you have to be forthright about it. And I mean, so far, the FTC has gone after quite a number of companies who have paid people on, to talk about a product or service online and haven't disclosed that their view uh, is a compensated view as opposed to a, a totally neutral view. So uh, maybe I'll – you want to try to queue it up? Sure. I'll go back. Friday, Microwaves is announcing a very big project, or should I say, very little. <gasps> the pocket microwave? You can buy it on Friday along with everyone else. It has a ham button. You used my idea. Everyone shut up. Shut up, Lutz. Where's Lemon? She went to got a jury duty. Can we get lunch from McDonald's today? No. I need your creative input. I have spent the better part of the last three years developing a portable miniature microwave oven. Most of that time has been spent focused on coming up with a hip, edgy name for the product, something that will appeal to the marketing holy trinity, college students, the morbidly obese, and homosexuals. Unfortunately, the legal just informed me that the name we settled on for our bite-sized microwave, the Bite Nuker, is highly offensive to those who speak either French or Dutch. A Franco-Dutchman would pronounce it Bet Nuker. Hey, that's awful. I'm sorry, Mrs. LaRoche Vanderhoot. This product rolls out in two days. We're in danger of losing the European market. Everyone here needs to brainstorm new names. Starting today, you are all members of the microwave division. We should make t-shirts. Yes, and you're in charge of that. Remember, this isn't TGS, guys. Let's not shoot for the middle this time. Kenneth, you go. A name for a pocket microwave oven. That's me, a little microwave oven. So it's kind of like a fun cooker. Snappy, fresh, and incapable of offending. Jonathan, get legal on the phone. Kenneth, I owe you one. Warm hug, you mean? Jonathan, it's our friend. Hey, America! Oh, Jesus, please cover for them. Pick up my fun cooker! Did you say fun cooker? Oh, that's where I've heard that. All right, so Dan is, uh... Dan is now going to uh, come up and, and talk about um, ethics, and he's going to start uh, with <clears throat> he's going to start with uh, the fact that, believe it or not, lawyers have an ethical duty to understand social media uh, to the extent that it is relevant uh, to your practice. And this is the area of the presentation where you should take out your phone, and Dan's going to explain how that works for our hypotheticals, so you can text in your responses. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Kara for inviting me to speak. My life before law school, I was in charge of the social media at an internet startup. So some of this is near and dear to my heart. Uh, with regard to the duty of competency that Hera mentioned, this is rule 1.1, so it's at the top of the list. And it basically says that a lawyer has to provide competent representation to a client, which requires knowing legal knowledge, skill, and thoroughness, and preparation. And in one of the comments to this rule, it specifically mentions that you have to know about the benefits and risks associated with technology. And so this is an unequivocal statement from the bar that you have to know about the technology that you're using, the technology that your clients are using, the technology related to any matter that you're working on. So another rule, um, I think one of the most relevant things for everyone in this room with regard to social media is how you market yourself as a lawyer. And what is your own, how can you use social media um, in your everyday life without breaking the rules? 
And Rule 7.4, um, I'm focusing on the Pennsylvania rules, but most states have a pretty identical set of rules um, with the same numbering and everything. Um, a lawyer may communicate the fact that the lawyer does or does not practice in a particular field of law, and a lawyer shall not state that the lawyer is a specialist. Um, except uh, there are a few exceptions, and basically the takeaway is that uh, if you are certified as a specialist by an organization that is approved by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, then you can call yourself a specialist. Um, otherwise, you're not a specialist. Um, and this comes into play on social media. Um, and there was an interesting case before the New Hampshire Bar Association a few years ago. LinkedIn had uh, on its, you know, uh, default headings on their uh, profiles, one of the default headings was specialties. And a lawyer asked the New Hampshire Bar, can I list um, under specialties uh, areas of practice, or is that a violation of the ethical rule um, with regard to disclosing specialties? And the bar said, no. <laughs> The bar said you can list your areas of practice under uh, a heading called skills and expertise, um, but that you should be careful not to identify yourself as a specialist. And I think at that point, LinkedIn had changed the specialties header, but the bar association said that if you put it under specialties, then uh, you, know, you had to have the proper certification. So that's something where, as a lawyer, you have to be cognizant of what you're doing when you put things on social media so that you don't inadvertently run afoul of the rules. Um, other states, with regard to specialties, require that you disclaim uh, what the specialty means, uh, you know, who is issuing the certifications, um, that the certification doesn't guarantee results, or something like that. Um, Pennsylvania doesn't have a disclaimer rule, but uh, New York, for example, does. And New York requires that you prominently show the disclaimer. Um, so this kind of relates back to this um, challenge with the FTC disclaimers, which is that on social media, you may not always have the space, um, but that you need to make the space or don't, don't post it. So this is, a, this is a section of the presentation that on my personal notes here, I have titled uh, Fun with Dan's LinkedIn page. Um, so this is, this is my LinkedIn page, and um, it's, this is for instructional purposes only. For your benefit, I have doctored it up uh, with some hypotheticals about what exactly you can and can't do on your LinkedIn page. So zooming in at the top, uh, it says, Dan Englander, your IP attorney, at Ballard Spar. Um, does anyone have any ideas on to, as to whether this is proper or improper? Okay, well, I'll let you think about the next one, and someone has to raise their hand on the next one. Uh, so your IP attorney, I think that this is improper, because I think that this is borderline creating an attorney-client relationship. Um, that anyone who sees my LinkedIn page thinks that they can call me up and that I'm going to represent them. And that's not true. Um, so I think this is, uh, this is something that you, you should not do. Under summary, it says trademark specialist, patent expert, will solve your IP problems. So trademark specialist, um, I'm a member of the Georgia and New York bars. Uh, it's my understanding that neither of those bar associations have a certification for trademark specialists. Um, so I am not a trademark specialist, even though most of my practice is trademarks. Um, patent expert. Um, I think expert and specialist are arguably interchangeable. Um, so I would stay away from that as well, even though part of my practice is uh, patent litigation. Um, also, because I'm not a member of the patent bar, I think this is probably especially misleading. And then we'll solve your IP problems. Um, I think that's guaranteeing a result, which is improper. 
Um, so here, under the description of uh, my position, uh, it says fashion, trade dress, trademarks, IP licensing compliance, and IP litigation. I think this is exactly the kind of, uh, sort of proper listing of what your practice area consists of. Um, you're allowed to describe your practice, um, and you're allowed to talk about uh, the areas that you, uh, that you focus on. Certifications, trademark lawyer. Um, because no certification exists for trademark lawyers, um, I wouldn't put that in. And interests, uh, trademark law and international law. That's totally fine. You can, you can tell people what you're interested in. So now comes the, uh, the fun part. Um, so one way to do an ethics presentation is to just read the rules um, and watch you fall asleep. Uh, another way is to make it more interactive. And because this is Twitter style, we figured um, that we would have a technologically advanced audience who would be capable um, of uh, engaging with us in this way. Um, so if you get out your cell phone and go to where you would text someone, uh, we have some multiple choice questions. And we have uh, the number that you're going to be texting to is 22333. And we have this test question. Um, do you understand the instructions regarding how to vote by texting? So which, what number do they? Okay. I don't know why that. Does it have a number for? What's on that piece of paper though? Remind okay. Me yeah, yeah, there's a hypothetical, so there's a piece of paper in your uh, folder that has the numbers that you're supposed to text to for yes and no. Um, so you're texting to 22333, three, three, and if you understand the instructions, you text 657215, um, and it'll show up as, as yes. Um, everyone got it? Okay, well, we'll really see on the next one, and we'll see if the votes are coming in. Okay, so I have a, a few hypotheticals, and the first one is uh, you're the general counsel of a company called Luxio, uh, which is a high-end handbag company, and you suspect that a new company, uh, which is called Fakio, is using your trademark, uh, Luxbag, without your permission. Uh, you ask a more junior lawyer in your department to create a Twitter account under her real name and tweet at Fakio sales team, their sales Twitter account, and ask, do you guys sell any Luxio bags? And the question here is, are there any ethical violations in what you've instructed your uh, junior associate to do? Um, and here we have the real-time results. So A is, yes, there are ethical problems. B, no, this is okay. And C, no, this is a gray area because the bar hasn't set forth rules about lawyers' use of social media yet. So we'll watch the votes come in. Are you entering the number associated with the answer? So, uh, like A would be 658209. Not that A is the right answer. <laughs> Are people changing their answers? Yes. No, it's just more about their time. Well, yeah, and everyone that's on the everyone that is watching on the webinar can also vote uh, via text. And we hope you are. Okay, it looks like it's looks like it's settling down a little bit. Uh, so the consensus is that 
there are ethical problems. And uh, to develop a little bit of suspense, I'm not going to tell you what the answer is right now. And we're going to go to the next one. We're going to come back to these after we've gone through uh, the rules and the cases that, that set these out. Um, hypo number two is you're still Luxio's general counsel. Uh, Luxio previously litigated a trademark infringement claim against Copycate, who is a one-woman company that sells luxury goods through its website. Uh, there's a settlement agreement where Copycate can't use Luxio's trademarks. Um, you now suspect that Copycate is using your trademarks without permission again. So you tell a junior lawyer to create a profile on Facebook under a fake name and send messages to the official Copycate Facebook page asking general questions about its products to see whether Copycate is infringing. Uh, so are there any, the question again is, are there any ethical problems? Uh, a, no, this is okay because the questions are general, and that's 660-763. B is, no, this is okay because the, the investigation is online, and that's 660-764. And uh, answer C is, yes, there are ethical problems because the junior lawyer used a fake name, and that's 660-756. Okay, this one's a little bit more lopsided. People don't like the fake name. After I said something, it started evening out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll move on to, to what the rules say. Um, and the rules say that um, 4.1 says that a lawyer shall not make a statement of material fact or law, make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person, um, or fail to disclose a material fact to a third person when disclosure is necessary to avoid aiding and abetting you know, a criminal or fraudulent act. Um, so you can't make a, a false statement of material fact or law. Um, rule 4.2. Uh, says that you shall not communicate uh, the subject of the representation with a person that you know to be represented by another lawyer. Um, rule 5.3 says that um, when you're a supervisor of a lawyer, it's still kind of a long rule, but the gist of it, the Twitter style version, is that if you are a supervising attorney, and you direct uh, a, a junior lawyer or a non-lawyer uh, that you supervise to violate one of the rules, uh, then that's a violation in and of itself. And then rule 8.4 is that it's professional misconduct for a lawyer to violate or attempt to violate the rules of professional conduct knowingly, assist or induce another to do so, or do so through the acts of another, or what what we're concerned about here is engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. So we're still going to go back to hypos one and two, um, but you will get the answer to this one soon after. Um, hypo number three, you're still Luxio's general counsel. Litigation is now underway against Fakio, the company from the first hypo, and the deposition of Fakio's CEO is coming up. You ask your neighbor to friend Fakio's CEO on Facebook, follow the CEO's private Instagram account, take screenshots of the CEO's profile and postings once the neighbor's request is accepted, and send the screenshots to you. And the question again is, are there any ethical problems? And A is yes because you use deception. B is yes because you asked your neighbor to do it. C is both A and B, and D there are no ethical problems here. Alright, 
school. Looks like there's a plurality for C. This one, this one might be the most even one. Well, lucky for you, we have some clear guidance on this particular question because this is designed after um, Philadelphia Bar Association opinion, um, where in 2009, an attorney asked the guidance committee if they could do this exact thing, which is ask a third party to friend uh, a deponent online using the third party's real name and then provide the information from the deponent's page to the attorney without revealing his affiliation. Um, and the, the professional guidance committee in no uncertain terms said that this is not okay um, because it's a violation of rule 8.4C, which is uh, the rule that says that you can't uh, use deception. Um, the committee said it omits a highly material fact, namely that the third party who asks to be allowed access to the witness's pages is doing so only because he or she is intent on obtaining the information and sharing it. Other guidance that we have um, from the courts uh, is not as not as on point. And I think that this is a really interesting uh, area of law to uh, give a CLE on and an interesting area of law to follow because there's so much new stuff going on. There's new rules, there's new ethics opinions, um, and there's new technology um, that you know causes, causes lawyers to uh, ask bar, <laughs> bar associations what they should be doing. Um, I think one, one place where uh, we can maybe gain some guidance or maybe it's more confusing, you can, you can decide for yourself, is looking at um, an analogy to the physical world. And in the, in the intellectual property context, there are two interesting cases that I want to share with you, and one is called Apple Corps. And in Apple Corps, uh, there was a stamp company who was selling stamps that had, uh, they were Beatles stamps. Uh, they said the word Beatles and they had pictures of the members of the Beatles. And uh, Yoko Ono and uh, some other people that have rights to the Beatles uh, had litigated against them and there was a settlement agreement. And they thought that the stamp company was violating the settlement agreement. And so the lawyer, for Yoko Ono, called the stamp company, posing as a customer, uh, and was just asking questions over the phone, and figured out that they were indeed selling these stamps that were infringing, and then had non-parties also call to confirm that they were selling uh, these stamps. And the district court in New Jersey uh, carved out this exception to the deception rule um, where, you know, attorneys are not allowed to engage in deception. But the court said that for this policy purpose of investigating intellectual property infringement, uh, that in order to find out if this is going on, in order to gather enough information to know if you have a well-pled claim, uh, that, this was, that this was okay, that this was the only way you're going to find out this information um, so that it's not a violation of the ethical rules. And then in the next year, uh, in the Southern District of New York, um, there was a furniture company that was selling furniture using uh, the plaintiff's trademarks. And similarly, there was a settlement agreement that uh, prohibited this. And so the plaintiff sent in actual investigators into uh, the, the, the showroom and was at, they were asking questions about uh, the furniture and trying to figure out if the settlement agreement was being violated. And uh, the court again found the same exception uh, to intellectual property investigations, uh, that the use of private investigators uh, does not constitute an end run around the attorney-client privilege and the investigators merely recorded the normal business routine of the showroom and warehouse. 
So this is an interesting exception to the deception rule. And um, the question that I think is so interesting uh, and really shows how social media you know, might be complicating things is how are these reconciled? When you have the Philadelphia Bar Association saying that friending someone before a deposition is deception, that's a violation of the ethical rule, but you still have these cases that are based on facts in the real world that are talking about this intellectual property infringement investigation exception. And the question is whether that exception exists for social media. And, you know, we have a, a lot of clients who, you know, will identify a potential infringer to us and, you know, I'm sitting at the computer and the best way to figure out information about them is to do an internet search and try and figure out what we know. Uh, you know, can I, you know, can I send them a Twitter message? Can I friend them on Facebook? All these kinds of questions I think are interesting. Um, so going back, this is completely safe. Going back to Hypo 1, which is supposed to be modeled off of uh, this Getatex and this Apple Core case, but in the social media sphere, um, you ask your junior lawyer basically to be an investigator. And uh, she's using her real name, and she's asking general questions. She's kind of the online version of the investigators that went into the showroom. Um, and so are there any ethical problems? And everyone said yes, 62% of you said yes. Um, you know, if we apply this intellectual property exception to the social media space, um, you know, maybe it is okay. But I think the takeaway is that there's a gray area uh, and we don't have clear guidance um, from, from the bar association or from the courts about exactly what the parameters are of, you know, what our behavior can be online. Um, so it will be, be interesting to get more clarification. Um, and this is, uh, I'm going to bring you home with this one, and then we'll, we can take questions or, what's that? Oh yeah, the results for typo 2. So there were uh, there's a lot of ethical problems in this one that are kind of hidden, um, and uh, I think it's worth worthwhile to go through them. Um, one thing that's different about this this typo is that Copycate is a one woman company, and so uh, you know we talked about. Uh, Four point, rule 4.2, which is um, you can't talk with someone that you know is represented on a matter. Um, and so since there's a settlement agreement and since Copycate's a one-woman company, I think it's safe to assume that when you're communicating with her, that, uh, that when you're communicating with the company, you're communicating with her and that you know she's represented because she's bound by the settlement agreement. Um, uh, the other thing here is that um, the associate that works for you is under your direct control. And so uh, to the extent that junior lawyer is uh, engaging in something that's a violation of the rules, uh, you are as well because you directed her to do that. Um, the I think this one is more likely than the first one to be found to be dishonest uh, because of the fake name. And I think that's, um, that's, you know, that's the violation that we put up there. Um, yes, because the junior lawyer used the fake name, although there are other ethical violations here. Um, but I think that that one is much more obvious that um, the junior lawyer concealed her identity and under rule 8.4, uh, you can't do that.
So our last typo is this. A member of your social media team posts a photo on your company's Instagram stream uh, that he found on the internet. And the owner of that photo uh, sends a cease and desist letter to you claiming copyright infringement. And you instruct the social media team to delete the Instagram post. And the question is, again, are there any ethical problems? And no, A is no, this is okay. And B, yes the removal of the post is spoliation of evidence, or C, removing the photo is okay, but only if you keep a copy of the Instagram post. So this is some cutting edge ethics law. This is the bar this is based on a bar association opinion from the Philadelphia Bar Association that came out this summer. And a lawyer asked, you know, they give out advisory opinions based on lawyers' questions, and a lawyer asked basically this exact question. Um, and 70% of you are correct. Um, the, the Bar Association basically said that um, you can instruct your client to take things down off of social media. And I think that is a, um, a helpful tip. You can have people uh, remove things from their own pages. Uh, what you can't do is uh, delete things so they can't be used in evidence um, where they might be relevant. And so um, I think that is, uh, it's helpful from the IP context, you know, in this particular case, um, you know, if the lawyer said take it down but save a copy and send it to me, um, that's the most, most prudent way to go about things. Um, but it also means that, you know, um, you know, my dad's a personal injury lawyer, and I think about some of the problems that he's faced with his clients posting things on social media. Um, <laughs> and what this is saying is that you can counsel your clients about how to use social media in a smart way, um, but, you know, you have to still be cognizant of, of um, you know, running afoul of the spoliation rule. So that's a, that's a wrap on ethics, um, and we'd love to take questions, if you guys have questions. What's Instagram? <laughs> uh, someone, is, someone is asking what's Instagram. And Instagram is, um, you know, it's a, it's a mobile app where you can share photos with people. Um, it's more limited than Facebook in that there's fewer things you could share besides photos. And uh, I guess there's... Uh, you can't download things, and it's it's a little more uh, transient than Facebook. Um, but uh, but all the hip kids are using these days. So you have to know about it. Well, thank you very much, and we'll be around for drinks. <laughs>